Chapter 11 Convert Feldman fought for control of himself, forced himself to think, to hold on to his sanity. It was sheer stupidity since nothing could have been more merciful than to lose this reality. But the will to be himself was stronger than logic. And bit by bit, he forced the fear and horror away from him until he could examine his situation. He was spinning slowly so that stars ahead of him seemed to crawl across his view. The ship was retreating from him already hundreds of yards away. Mars was a shrunken pill far away. Then something blinked to one side. He turned his head to stare. A little ship was less than three hundred yards away. He recognized it as a life raft. Now his spin brought him around to face it, and he saw it was paralleling his course. The ejection of the life raft must have caused the thump he heard before he was cast adrift. It meant someone was trying to save him. It meant life. He flailed his arms and beat his legs together, senselessly trying to force himself closer while trying to guess who could have taken the chance. No one he could think of could have booked passage on the Iroquois. There wasn't that much free money in the villages. Something flashed a hot blue, and the little ship leaped forward. Whoever was handling it knew nothing about piloting. It picked up too much speed at too great an angle. Again, blue spurts came, but this time matters were even worse. Then there was a long wait before a third try was made. He estimated the course. It would miss him by a good hundred feet, but it was probably the best the amateur pilot could do. The ship drifted closer, but to one side. It would soon pass him completely. A space-suited figure suddenly appeared in the tiny airlock, holding a coil of rope. The rope shot out, well thrown, but it was too short. It would pass within ten feet, and might as well have been ten miles for all the good it would do him. Every film he had seen on space seemed to form a mad jumble in his mind, but he seized on the first idea he could remember. He inhaled deeply and yanked the oxygen tank free. An automatic seal on the suit cut off the connection. He aimed the hissing bottle, fumbling for the manual valve. It almost worked. It kicked him toward the rope slightly, but most of the energy was wasted in setting him into a wilder spin. He blinked, trying to spot the rope. It was within five feet now. Again, he waited until he seemed to be in position. This time, he threw the bottle away from it. It added spin to his vertical axis, but the rope came into view within arm's reach. He grasped it, just as his lungs seemed about to burst. He couldn't hold on long enough to tie the rope. His lungs gave up suddenly, collapsing and then sucking in greedily. Clean air rushed in, letting his head clear. He'd forgotten that the inflated suit held enough oxygen for several minutes. His body struck the edge of the airlock, and a hand jerked him inside. The outer seal was slammed shut and locked, and there was a hiss of air entering. He threw back his helmet just as Chris Ryan jerked hers off. Her voice shook almost hysterically. Thank God, Dan. I almost gave up. I liked the air out there better, he told her bitterly. If you'll open the lock again, I'll leave. Or am I supposed to believe this is rescue and that you just came along to save me? I came along to see you killed, as you know very well. Saving you wasn't in my orders. He grunted and reached for the handle that would release the outer lock. Better get back inside if you don't want to blow out with me. It's up to you, Dan, she told him, and there was all the sincerity in the world in her blue eyes. I'm on your side now. He began counting on his fingers. Let's see. The spare battery, the delay in arresting me, the choice of Matthews. It was all true. Anger began to grow in her eyes. Dan Feldman, you get inside this raft. If you don't care about me, you might consider the people dying of the plague who need you. She'd played her trump, and it took the round. He followed her. All right, he said grudgingly. Spill your story. She held out a copy of a space radiogram, addressed to Mrs. D. E. Everts, and signed by one of the best doctors on the lobby board of directors. Regret confirmed diagnosis. Top secret. Repeat, top secret. Martian fever incubates 14 years, believed highly fatal. No cure, research beginning immediately. Penalty violation top secret, death, all concerned. 
Mrs. Everts rates a top secret break? Doc commented dryly. Come off it, Chris. She's the daughter of Elmers of Space Lobby, Chris answered. She pointed to the message, underlining words with her finger. Fourteen years. You couldn't have caused it. Highly fatal, and people are being told it's only a skin disease. Research beginning, but you've already done most of the research. I can see that now. I can see a lot of things. You've got me beat, then, he said. I can't see how such a reformed young noblewoman calmly walked over and stole a life raft. I can't see how your brilliant mind concocted this whole scheme in almost no time. And to be honest, I can't even see why Medical Lobby decided to save me at the last minute and sent you to do the job. You didn't have to spy out knowledge from me. I've been trying all along to get it to your research division. She sighed and dropped onto a little seat. I can't prove my motives. You'll just have to believe me. But it wasn't hard to do what I've done. That shuttle pilot was found in a routine check, stowed away on the life raft. I was with Captain Everts when he was found, so I discovered how to get into the raft. And I heard his whole confession. He wasn't the real pilot. He'd come from the villages to save you. The whole scheme was his. I just used it, hoping I could reach you. As always, her story had a convincing element she shouldn't have known. The pilot's farewell, addressing him as Dr. Feldman, had been too low for her to hear, but it was something that fitted her story. It was probably a deliberate clue to give him hope, to assure him the villages were still trying. It shook his confidence. And your motive? Your real motive? He insisted. She swore at him, then began ripping off the spacesuit. She turned her back, pulling a thin blouse down from her neck. He stared, then reached out to touch the lump there. So you've had Selznick's migraine, and you know you're carrying the plague, and you've decided your precious lobby won't save you. She dropped her eyes, then raised them to meet his defiantly. I'm not just scared and selfish. Dad caught it, too, and it must be close to the time for him. He switched to Mars Normal when he was a liaison agent and never changed back. Dan, are we all going to have to die? Can't you save him? Feldman was out of his suit and at the control panel. There was a manual lever which Chris must have used before. It might work out here where there was room to maneuver and nothing to hit, but trying to make a landing was going to be different. Dan, she repeated. He shrugged. I don't know. They've started research too late and they'll be under so much pressure that the real brains won't have a chance. The top-secret stuff looks bad for research. Maybe there's a cure. It works in culture bottles, but it may fail in person. When I'm convinced I'm safe with you, I may tell you about it. Oh. Her voice was low. Then she sighed. I suppose I can understand why you hate me, Dan. I don't hate you. I'm too mixed up. Tomorrow, maybe. But not now. Shut up and let me see if I can figure out how to land this thing. He found that the fuel tanks were nearly full, but that still didn't leave much margin. Mars must have been notified by Everts and be ready to pick up the craft. He had to reach the wastelands away from any of the shuttle ports. They had no aspirators, however, and they couldn't cover much territory in the spacesuits they would have to use. It meant he'd have to land close to a village where he was known. He jockeyed the ship around by trial and error, studying the manual that was lying prominently on the control panel. According to the booklet, the ship was simple to operate. It was self-leveling in an atmosphere, and automatic flare computers were supposed to make it possible for an amateur to judge the rate of descent near the surface. It looked reassuring, and was probably written with that in mind. Finally, he reached for the control, hoping he'd figured his landing orbit reasonably well by simple logic. He smoothed it out in the following hours as he watched the markings on Mars. When they were near turnover point, he began cranking the little gyroscope to swing the ship. It saved fuel to turn without power, and he wasn't sure he could have turned accurately by blasting. He was gaining some proficiency, however, he felt. But now he had to waste fuel and ruin his orbit again. There was no way to practice maneuvering without actually doing so. In the end, he compromised, leaving a small margin for a bad landing that would require a second attempt but with less practice than he wanted. He had located Jake's village through the little telescope when he finally reached for the main blast control. The thin haze of Mars's atmosphere came rushing up while the blast lashed out. 
Then they were in the outer fringes of the sky, and the blast was beginning to show a corona that ruined visibility. He turned to the flare computer and back to what he could see through the quartz viewport. He was going to land about a half mile from the village, as nearly as he could judge. The computer seemed to work as it should. The speed was within acceptable limits. He gave up trying to see the ground and was forced to trust the machinery designed for amateur pilots. The flare bloomed and he yanked down on the little lever. It could have been worse. They hit the ground, bounced twice, and turned over. The ship was a mess when Feldman freed himself from the elastic straps of the seat. Chris had shrieked as they hit, but she was unbuckling herself now. He threw her her spacesuit and one of the emergency bottles of oxygen from the rack. Hurry up with that. We've sprung a leak, and the pressure's dropping. They were halfway to the village when a dozen tractors came racing up, and Jake piled out of the lead one to drag the two in with him. Heard about it from the broadcasts and figured you might land around here. Good to see you, Doc. He started the tractor off at full speed back to the wastelands, while Doc stared at the armed men who were riding the tractors. Jake caught his look and nodded. You're in enemy territory, Doc. There's a war going on. Chapter 12 War Sometimes it seemed to Doc that war was nothing but an endurance race to see how many times they could run before they were bombed. He was just beginning to drop off to sleep after a long trip for the sixth consecutive day when the little alarm shrilled. He sighed and shook Chris awake. Again, she protested, but she got up and began helping him pack. Jake came in, his eyes weary, pulling on the old jacket with the big star on its sleeve. Doc hadn't been too surprised to learn that Jake was the actual leader of the rebels. Shuttle spotted, taking off this way. I still can't find out where the leak is. They haven't missed our location once this week. Here, give me that. He took the electron mic that had been among Doc's possessions, but Chris recaptured it. I can manage, she told him, and headed out for the tractor where Lou was waiting. Doc scowled at her. He and Jake had been watching her. She was too useful to Doc's research to be turned away, but they didn't trust her yet. So far, however, they had found nothing wrong with her conduct. Still. He swung suddenly into Jake's tractor. Just remembered something. How'd they find me that time I stopped in the tractor to use the mic? I was pretty well hidden, and no tracks last in the sand long enough for them to have followed. But they were there when I came to. Somehow they must have put a radio tracer on me. Jake waited while they lighted up, his eyes suddenly bright. You mean, something you got from her house was bugged? It figures. And I've still got all the stuff. Now they find wherever we set up headquarters, though they've always managed to miss my laboratory, even when they've hit the troops around us. Jake, I think it's the microscope. Doc managed to push enough junk off one of the seats to make a cramped bed and stretched out. Sure, we figured they sent her because they want to keep tabs on what I discover. They've finally gotten scared of the plague, and she's the perfect Judas goat, but they have to have some way to get in touch with her. I'll bet there's a tracer in the mic and a switch so she can modulate it or key it to send out Morse. Yeah, Jake nodded. Well, she does her own dirty work. I might get to like her if she was on our side. Okay, Doc, if they've put things into the mic, I've got a boy who'll find it and fix it so she won't guess it's been touched. Doc relaxed. For the moment, there would be no power in the instrument, nor any excuse for her to use it. But she must have handled some secret arrangement during the work periods. She used the mic more than he did. The switch could be camouflaged easily enough. If anyone detected the signal, they'd probably only think it was some leak in the electrical circuit. Far away, the shuttle rockets had appeared as tiny dots in the sky. They were standing on their tails a second later, just off the ground, letting the full force of their blasts bake the area where the headquarters had been. Jake watched grimly, driving by something close to instinct. Then he looked back. Know anything about a Dr. Harkness? Not much, except that he protested sealing off the villages. Why? He and five other doctors were picked up, trying to get through to us, claimed they wanted to give us medical help. We can use them, God knows. I guess I'll have to chance it. They stopped at a halfway village and hid the tractors before looking for a place to rest. Doc found Chris curled up asleep against the microscope. He had a hard time getting her to leave it in the tractor, but she was too genuinely tired to put up any real argument.
Jake reported in the morning before they set out again. You were right, Doc. It was a nice job of work. Must have taken the best guys in Southport to hide the circuit so well. But it's safe now. It just makes a kind of meaningless static nobody can trace. Maybe we can get you a permanent lab now. Doc debated again having Chris left behind and decided against it. The lobby was determined to let him find a cure for them, if he could. That meant Chris would work herself to exhaustion trying to help. Let her think she was doing it for the lobby. It was time she was on the receiving end of a double cross. It's a stinking way to run a war, he decided. Jake chuckled without much humor. It's the war you wanted, remember? They forced our hand, but it had to come sometime. Right now the lobby's fighting to get their hands on your work before we can use it. They're just using holding tactics, which helps our side. And we're hoping you get the cure so we can win. With that, maybe we'll whip them. It was a crazy war, with each side killing more of its own men than of the enemy. The runners were increasing, and Jake's army was learning to shoot the poor devils mercifully and go on. They knew at least that there was no current danger of infection. In the lobby towns, more were dying of panic in their efforts to escape the runners. Desert towns had joined the villages, reluctantly but inevitably, to give the rebels nearly three-quarters of the total population. But the lobby forces in the few cities held most of the real fighting equipment, and they were ready to wait until Earth could send out unmanned rockets loaded with atomics, which could cut through space at ten times normal speed. There were vague lines of battle, but time was the vital factor. The lobbies waited to steal a cure for the plagues, and the villages waited until they could announce it and demand surrender as its price. It looked as if both sides were doomed to disappointment, however. He and Chris had put in every spare minute between moving and the minimum of sleep in searching for something that would check the disease. It couldn't grow in an earth-normal body, but it didn't die either. And there wasn't enough normal food available to permit the switchover for more than a handful of people. Even Earth was out of luck, since 80% of her population ate synthetics. There were ways to synthesize Earth-normal food, but they were still hopelessly inefficient. Jake had ordered one of the villages to rebuild their plant for such a purpose, while another was producing the enzyme that would permit switching. But it looked hopeless for more than a few of the most valuable men. No progress? Jake asked for the hundredth time. Doc grinned wryly. A lot, but no help. We found a fine accelerator for the bug. We can speed up its incubation, or even make someone already infected catch it all over again. But we can't slow it, or stop it. The new laboratory was still being fitted when they arrived. It had been dug into one of the few real cliffs in this section of Mars. The power plant had been installed, complete with a steam plant that would operate off sunlight in the daytime through a series of heat valves that took in a lot of warm air and produced smaller amounts hot enough to boil water. I'll see you whenever I can, Jake said, but mostly you're going to be somewhat isolated so they won't trace you. Let them think they goofed with the shuttles and hit you and Chris. Anything you need? Guinea pigs, Doc told him sarcastically. It was meant as a joke, though a highly bitter one. Jake nodded and left them. Doc opened the cots as Chris came in, not bothering to unpack the equipment. Hit the sack, Chris, he told her. She looked at him doubtfully. You almost said that the way you'd address a human being, Dan. You're slipping. One of these days you'll like me again. Maybe. He was too tired to argue. I doubt it, though. Forget it and get some sleep. She watched him silently until he got up to turn out the light. Then she sighed heavily. Dan. Yeah? I never got a divorce. The publicity would have been bad. But anyway, we're still married. That's nice. He swung to face her briefly. And they found the radio in the microscope. Better get to sleep, Chris. Oh. It was a quiet exclamation, barely audible. There was a sound that might have been a sniffle if it had come from anyone else. Then she rolled over. All right, Dan. I still want to help you. He cursed himself for a stupid fool for telling her. Fatigue was ruining what judgment he had. From now on, he'd have to watch her every minute, 
or had she really seen the value of the research by now? She wasn't a fool. It should have registered even on her stubborn mind. But he was too sleepy to think about it. She had breakfast ready in the morning. She made no comment on what had been said during the night. Instead, she began discussing a way to keep one of the organic antibiotics from splitting into simpler compounds when they tried to switch it over to Mars Normal. They were both hopelessly bad chemists and biologists, but there was no one else to do the work. Chris worked harder than ever during the day. Just after sundown, Jake came in with a heavy box. He dropped it on the floor. Mice! Doc ripped off the cover, exposing fine screening. There were at least six dozen mice inside. Harkness found them, Jake explained. A hormone extraction plant used them for testing some of the products. Had them sent by regular shipments from Earth. Getting them cost a couple of men, but Harkness claims it's worth it. He's a good man on a raid. Here. He'd gone to the doorway again and came back with another box, this one crammed with bottles and boxes. They had quite a laboratory, and Harkness picked out whatever he thought you could use. Chris and Doc were going through it. The labels were engineering ones, but the chemical formulae were identification enough. There were dozens of chemicals they hadn't hoped to get. Anything else? Doc finally asked as they began arranging the supplies. More runners. A lot more. We're still holding things down, but it's reaching a limit. Panic will start in the camps if this keeps on. But that's my worry. You stick to yours. Several of the new chemicals showed promise in the tubes, but two of them proved fatal to the mice and the others were completely innocuous in the little animals' bodies, both to mouse and to germ. The plague was much hardier in contact with living cells than in the artificial environment of the culture jars. They lost seven mice in two days, but that seemed unimportant. The females were already living up to their reputations, nearly all pregnant. Doc didn't know the gestation period, but he remembered that it was short. Funny they all started at the same time, he commented. Must have been shipped out separately or else been kept apart while they were switched over to Mars Normal. Something interrupted their habits anyhow. A few nights later they learned what it was. There was a horrible squealing that woke him out of the depths of his sleep. Chris was already at the light switch. As light came on, they turned to the mouse box. All the animals were charging about in their limited space, their little legs driving madly and their mouths open. What they lacked in size, they made up in numbers, and the din was terrific. But it didn't last. One by one, the mice began dropping to the floor of the cage. In fifteen minutes, they were all dead. It was obviously the plague, contracted after having their metabolism switched. Women were sterile for some time after Selznick's migraine struck, and the same must have been true of the mice. They must have contracted the plague at about the same time, and reached fertility together. Somehow, the plague incubation period had been shortened to fit their lifespan. The disease was nothing if not adaptive. Chris prepared a slide in dull silence. The familiar cell was there when Doc looked through the microscope. He picked up one of the little creatures and cut it open, removing one of the fetuses. Make a film of that, he suggested. She worked rapidly, scraping out the almost microscopic brain dissolving out the fatty substance and transferring the result to a film. This time, even at full magnification, there was no sign of the filaments that were always present in diseased flesh. The results were the same for the other samples they made. Something about the very young animal or a secretion from the mother's organs keeps the bug from working. Doc reached for a bracky weed and accepted a light from Chris without thinking of it. Every kid I've heard about contracted the plague between the second and third year. None are born with it. None got it earlier. I've suspected this, but now here's confirmation. Chris began preparing specimens while Doc got busy with tubes of the culture. They'd have to test various fluids from the tiny bodies, but there were enough cultures prepared. Then if the substance only inhibited growth, there would be a long, slow test. If it killed the bugs... They might know more quickly. Jake came in before the final tests, but waited on them. Doc was studying a film in the microscope. He suddenly motioned excitedly for Chris. See the filaments? They're completely disintegrated, and there's one of the big cells broken open. We've got it. It's in the blood of the fetus. 
and it must be in the blood of the newborn children, too. Jake looked at the slide, but his face was doubtful. Maybe you got something, Doc. I hope so. And I hope you can use it. He shook his head wearily. We need good news right now. A couple of big rockets just reached the station, and they've been sending shuttles back and forth a mile a minute. Nobody can figure out how they got here so fast or what they're for. But it doesn't look good for us. Chapter 13 Susceptibility Doc could feel the tension in the village where GHQ was temporarily located long before they were close enough for details to register. The people were gathered in clusters, staring at the sky where the station must be. A few were pacing up and down, gesticulating with tight sweeps of their arms. One woman suddenly went into even more violent action. She leaped into the air and then took off at a rapid trot and then a run. Her hands were tearing at her clothes and her mouth seemed to be working violently. She was halfway to the top of the nearest dune before a rifle cracked. She dropped to twitch once and lie still. Almost with her death, another figure leaped from one of the houses, his face bare of the necessary aspirator. He took off at a violent run, but he was falling from lack of air before the bullet ended his struggles. The people suddenly began to move apart, as if trying to get away from each other. For weeks they had faced the horror with courage. Now it was finally too much for them. Tension mounted as no news came from the cities. Doc noticed that it seemed to aggravate or speed up the disease. He saw three men shot in the next half hour. He was trying to calm them with word of a possible cure for the plague, but their reactions were as curiously dull as those of Jake had been. As he spoke, they faced him with set expressions. At his mention of the need for the blood of young children, they turned from him, sullenly silent. Jake came over, nodding unhappily. It's what I was afraid might happen, Doc. George Lynn. Tell Doc what's wrong. Lynn was reluctant, but he finally stumbled out his explanation. It ain't like you, Doc. Comes from that lobby woman you got. It's her dirty idea. We've seen the lobby doctors cutting open our kids, poisoning their blood and bleeding them dry. That ain't gonna happen again, Doc. You tell her it ain't. Doc swore as he realized their ignorance. An unexplained vaccination looked like poisoning of the blood, but he couldn't understand the bleeding part until Jake filled him in. Northport's infant wing. Each department has its own blood bank, and donation is compulsory. Southport started it a couple months ago, too. The long arm of the lobby had reached out again. Now if he ever got them to try the treatment, it would only be after long sessions of preparing them with the facts, and there was hardly enough time for the crucial work. By afternoon, Judge Ben Wilson reached them. His voice shook with fatigue as he climbed up to address the crowd through a power megaphone. Southport's going crazy. He had to pause for breath between each sentence. Earth's pulling back all the important people. They're packing them into ships. They're leaving only colonials with no Earth rights. Those ships left when they decided the plague was coming from here. They won't let anybody back until the plague is licked. There won't be an Earth technician on Mars tomorrow. No bombs? someone called. No bombs. The ships must have started before you rebelled. Maybe meant honestly to save their own kind. But now it's a military action. And don't think it won't mean trouble. The poor devils in the city bet on the wrong horse. Now they can't run their food factories or anything else for long, not without technicians. They've got to whip you now. Up to this time they've been fighting for the lobbies. Now they'll fight for their own bellies to get your supplies. And they've still got shuttle rockets and fuel for them. Now beat it. I gotta confer with Jake. Doc started after the judge, but Dr. Harkness caught his arm and drew him aside. Chris followed. I've found another epidemic, Harkness told them, over at Marconi. It kept me on the run all night, and now half the village is down with it. Starts like a common cold, runs a fair fever, and the skin breaks out all over with bright red dots. He went on describing it. Chris began asking him about what medical supplies he had brought with him, pilfered from Northport Hospital. She seemed to know what it was, but refused to say until she saw the cases. Doc also preferred to wait. Sometimes things weren't as bad as they seemed, though usually they were worse. 
Marconi was dead to all outward appearances, with nobody on the streets. It had been a village of great hopes a week before, since this was where they had decided to experiment with switching the people back to Earth normal. They'd had the best chance of survival of anyone on Mars, until this came up. Three people lay on the beds in the first house Harkness led them to. The room was darkened, and a man was stumbling around, trying to tend the others, though the little spots showed on his skin. He grinned weakly. Hi, Doc. I guess we're making a lot of trouble, ain't we? Chris gave Doc no chance to answer. Just as I thought. Measles. Plain, old-fashioned measles. Figured so, said the sick man. Like my brother back on Earth. The others looked doubtful, but Doc reassured them. Chris should know. She'd worked in a swanky hospital where the patients were mostly Earth normal. Measles was one of the diseases which was foiled by the metabolism switch. Well, at least they wouldn't have to be quarantined here. Chris finished treating the family with impersonal efficiency, discussing the symptoms loudly with Harkness. It's a good thing it isn't serious. No, Harkness answered bitterly. Not serious. It's only killed five children and three adults so far. It would here, Doc agreed unhappily. He led Chris out of the room on the pretext of washing his hands. It's serious enough to force us to abandon the whole idea of going back to Earth normal. Measles today, smallpox, tuberculosis, scarlet fever, and everything else tomorrow. These people have lived Mars normal so long their natural immunity has been destroyed. On Earth, where the disease was everywhere, kids used to pick up some immunity with constant exposure, even without what might be called a case of the disease. Here, the blood has no reason to build antibodies. They can be killed by things people used to laugh at. How the disease got here, I don't know, but it's here. So we'll have to give up the idea of switching back to Earth normal. He gathered up one of the kits and started toward the other houses. And Lord knows how long it will take to get the blood for the other treatment even if it works. They worked as a team for a while, with Harkness frowning as he watched Chris. Finally, the young doctor stopped Chris outside the fifth house. These are my patients, Dr. Ryan. I left the lobby because I didn't believe colonials were mere livestock. I still feel the same. I appreciate your help in diagnosis and methods of treatment, but I can't let you handle my patients this way. Dan! She swung around with eyes glazing. Dan, are you going to stand for that? I think you'd better wait in the tractor, Chris. He was lucky enough to catch the kit she threw at him before its precious contents spilled, but it wasn't luck that guided his hand to the back of her skirt, hard enough to leave it stinging. Her face froze and she stormed out. A moment later they heard the tractor start off. But Doc had no time to think of her. He and Harkness split up and began covering the streets, house by house, while he passed on the word to abandon the metabolism switch and go back to Mars normal. Jake sent two other doctors to relieve them in the late evening. Things were somewhat quieter at GHQ as Doc reported the events at Marconi. "'Where's Dr. Ryan?' Jake asked at last. Doc exchanged glances with Harkness. "'She isn't in the lab?' "'Wasn't there an hour ago.' Doc cursed himself for letting her go. With the knowledge that the radio and the mic was still disabled, she'd obviously grabbed for the first chance to report back, and with her had gone news of the only cure they had found. Jake took it as philosophically as he could, though it was a heavy blow to his hopes. They spent half the night looking for her tractor, on the chance that she might have gotten lost or broken down, but there was no sign of it. She was waiting in the laboratory when he returned at dawn. Her face was dirty, and her uniform was a mess but she was smiling. She got up to greet him, holding out two large bottles. Infant plasma, straight from Southport. And if you think I had it easy lying my way in and out of the hospital, you're a fool, Dan Feldman. If the man who took my place there hadn't been a native idiot, I never would have gotten away with it. The things he had suspected could still be right, he realized. She could have reported everything to the lobby. It was a better explanation than her vague account of bullying her way in and out. But she'd had a rough drive and he wanted the plasma. Curiously, he was glad to have her back with him. He reached out a hand for the bottles. She put the bottle on the table and grabbed up a short-bladed knife. Not so fast, she cried. Her eyes were blazing now. 
Dan Feldman, if you touch those bottles until you've crawled across the floor on your face and apologized for the way you treated me the last few days, I'll cut your damned heart out. He shook his head, chuckling at the picture she made. There were times when he could almost see why he'd married her. All right, Chris, he gave in. I'll be darned if I'll crawl, but you've earned an apology. Okay? She sighed uncertainly. Then she nodded and began changing for work. Chapter 14 Immunity They worked through the day in what seemed to be armed truce. There was no coffee waiting for him when he awoke next, as he'd come to expect, but he didn't comment. He went to where she was already working, checking on the results of the plasma on the cultures. The response had been slower than with the mouse blood, but now the bugs seemed to be dead. The filaments were destroyed, and there were no signs of the big cells. It seemed to be a cure, at least in the culture bottles. We'll need volunteers, he decided. There should be animals, but we don't have any. At least this stuff isn't toxic. We need a natural immune and someone infected, two of each, so one can be treated and the other used for a control. Makes four. Not enough to be sure, but it will have to do. Two, Chris corrected. You're not infected. I am. Two others, he agreed. I'll get them from Jake. Most of GHQ was out on the street, but Doc found Jake inside the big schoolroom where he enjoyed his early morning bracky and coffee. The chief listened and agreed at once, turning to the others in the room. Who's had the jumping headache? Okay, Swanee. Who never had it? He blinked in surprise as three men nodded out of the eight present. I guess you go, Tom. The two men stood up, tamping out their weeds, and went out with Doc. Chris had everything set up. They matched coins to decide who would be treated. Doc noticed that Chris would get no plasma while he was scheduled for everything. He watched her prepare the culture and add the accelerator that would speed development and make certain he and Tom were infected, then let her inject it. That was all, except for the waiting. To keep conditions more closely alike, they were to stay there until the tests were finished, not even eating for fear of upsetting the conditions. Swanee dug out a pack of worn cards and began to deal, while Doc dug out some large pills to use as chips. It was an hour later when the pain began. Doc had just won the pot of fifty pills and opened his mouth for the expected gloating. He yelled as an explosion seemed to go off inside his head. Even closing his mouth, was agony. A moment later, Tom began to sweat. It got worse, spreading to the whole area of the back of the head and neck. Doc lay on the cot, envying Chris and Swanee, who had already been infected naturally. He longed desperately for Bracky, and had to keep reminding himself that no drugs must upset the tests. It was the longest day he had ever spent, and he began to doubt that he could get through it. He watched the little clock move from one minute to nine over to half a minute, and hung breathless until it hit the nine. There was no question about whether the infection had taken. Now they could dull the agony. Chris had the anodyne tablets already dissolved in water, and Swanee was passing out three lighted bracky weeds. It took a few minutes for the relief of the anodyne, and even that couldn't kill all the pain. But it didn't matter by comparison. He sucked the weed, mashed it out, and began dealing the cards again. They had a plentiful supply of the anodyne and used it liberally during the night. The test was a speeded-up simulation of the natural course of the disease, where painkiller would take time to get for most people here, but would then be used generously. Precisely at nine in the morning, Chris began to inject Swanee and Doc with plasma. Now there was no thought of cards. They waited, trying to talk, but with most of their attention on the clock. Doc had estimated that an hour should be enough to show results, but it was hard to remember that an hour was the guess as to the minimum time. He winced as Chris took a tiny bit of flesh from his neck. She went to the other men, and then submitted to his work on herself. Then she began preparing the slides. Feldman. She read the name of the slide as she inserted it into the microscope. Then her breath caught sharply. Only dead cells! It was the same for Swanee and Tom. Each had to look at his own slide and have it explained before the results could be believed, but at last Chris bent over her own slide 
A minute later, she glanced up, nodding. What it should be. It checks. Tom whooped and went out the door to notify Jake. There was only plasma for some two hundred injections, but that should yield sufficient proof. Once salvation was offered, there should be no trouble convincing the people that blood donations from their children were worthwhile. Later, when the last of the plasma had been used, they could finally relax. Chris slipped off her smock and dropped onto the cot. A tired smile came onto her lips. "'You're forgiven, Dan,' she said. A moment later she was obviously asleep. Doc meant to join her, but it was too much effort. He leaned his head forward onto his arms, vaguely wondering why she was calling off the feud. It was night outside when he awoke, and he was lying on the cot, though he still felt cramped and strained. He stirred, groaning, and finally realized that a hand was on his shoulder, shaking him. He looked up to see Jake above him. Chris was busy with the coffee maker. Jake slumped onto the cot beside Doc. We took Southport, he announced. That knocked the sleep out of Doc's system. You what? We took it. Lock, stock, and barrel. I figured the news of your cure would put guts into the men, and it did. But we'd probably have taken it anyhow. There wasn't anything to fight for there after Earth pulled out and the plague really hit. Wilson mistook last-minute panic for fighting spirit. The poor devils didn't have anything to fight about once the lobby stopped goading them. Doc tried to assimilate the news, but once the surprise was gone, he found it meant very little. Maybe his revolutionary zeal had cooled once the lobby men had pulled out. We'll need a lot more plasma than there is in Southport, he said. Not so much, maybe, Jake denied. Doc, three of the men you injected were shot down as runners. Your plasma's no good. It takes time to work, Jake. I told you there might be a case or two that would be too close to the edge. Three is more than I expected, but it's not impossible. There was plenty of time. They blew after we got back from Southport. Jake dropped his hand on Doc's shoulder and his face softened. Harkness tested every man you injected. He finished half an hour ago. Five showed dead bugs. The rest of them weren't helped at all. Doc fumbled for a weed, trying to think, but his thoughts refused to focus. Five? Five out of two hundred. That's about average. And what about Tom? He was jumping around after the test last night, telling how you'd cured him, how he'd seen the dead bugs. But he never had the jumping headache, and you never gave him the plasma. He's got dead bugs, though. Harkness tested him. Doc let his realization of his own idiocy sink in until he could believe it. Jake was right, Tom had never been treated. Yet Chris had reported dead bugs. They'd all been so ready to believe in miracles that no one had been able to think straight after the long wait. There was a bump on his neck, a, a small one, he said slowly. Jake, he must have caught it, even if he seemed immune. If he was taking anodyne anyway for something, or, or unconscious. He was in Northport. Six years ago for a kidney operation, Jake admitted doubtfully. We had to chip in to pay for it, but you still didn't treat him and he's cured. Face it, Doc, that plasma is no good inside the body. His hand tightened on Doc's shoulder. We're not blaming you. We don't judge a man here except by what he is. Maybe the stuff helps a little. We'll go on using it when we get it. Tell everybody you were a mite optimistic so they'll figure it's a gamble, but have a little hope left. And you keep trying. Something cured it in Tom, now you find out what. Doc watched him go out numbly and turned to Chris. It can't be right, she said shakily. You and Swanee were cured. Maybe it was the accelerator. It had to be something. You didn't have the accelerator, he accused. No. And I've still got live bugs. I was never supposed to be cured, so I expected to see just what I saw. How I missed the fact that Tom should have been like me, I don't know. Damn it! Oh, damn it! He'd never seen her cry before except in fury. But she mastered it almost at once, shaking tears out of her eyes. All right. Plasma works in a bottle, but not in an adult body. Maybe something works in the body, but not in a bottle. Maybe. 
and maybe people are just naturally immune after it reaches a certain stage. Maybe we ran into a coincidence. But he didn't believe that any more than she did. The answer had to be in the room. He'd taken a massive dose of the disease and been cured in a few hours. Outside the room, the war went on, drawing toward a close. The supposed partial cure was good propaganda, if nothing else, and Jake was widening his territory steadily. There was only token resistance against him. He had the Southport shuttles now to cover huge areas in a hurry, but inside the room the battle was less successful. It wasn't the accelerator. It wasn't the tablets of anodyne. They even tried sweeping the floor and using the dust without results. Then another test in the room, made with four volunteers, Jake selected, yielded complete cures after injections with plain salt water in place of plasma. The plague speeded up again. About four people out of a hundred now seemed to have caught the disease and cured themselves. They accounted for what faith was left in Doc's plasma and gave some unfounded hope to the others. Northport fell a week later, putting the whole planet in rebel hands. Jake returned wearier than ever. He proved to be one of the natural immunes, but the weight of the campaign that could only end in a defeat by the plague left him no room to rejoice in his personal fortune. This time he looked completely defeated, and a moment later Doc saw why as Jake flipped a flimsy sheet onto the table. It bore the seals of space and medical lobbies. Jake pointed upwards. The war rockets are there, all right. We knew they'd come. Now all they want for calling them off is our surrender and your cure. If they don't get both, they'll blow the planet to bits. We have two days. The rockets could be seen clearly with binoculars. There were more than enough to destroy all life on the planet. Maybe they'd be used eventually anyhow, since the lobbies wanted no more rebellion. But with a cure for the plague, he might have bought them off. Chris stood beside him, looking as if it were a bitter pill for her, too. She'd risked herself in the hands of the enemy, had cooperated with him in everything she'd been taught to oppose, and had worked like a dog. Now the lobby seemed to forget her as a useless tool. They were falling back on a raw power play and forgetting any earlier schemes. Maybe they'd hold off for a while if I agreed to go to them and share all my ideas, specimens, and notes, he said at last. Do you think your lobby would settle for that, Chris? I don't know, Dan. I've stopped thinking their way. She seemed almost apologetic for the admission. He dropped an arm over her shoulder and turned with her back to the laboratory. Okay, then. We've got to find a miracle. We've got two days ahead of us. At least we can try. But he knew he was lying to himself. There wasn't anything he could think of to try. Chapter 15 Decision Two days was never enough time for a miracle, Doc decided as he packed his notes into a small bag and put it beside his bundle of personal belongings. He glanced around the room for the last time and managed a grin at Jake's gloomy expression. Maybe I can bluff them, or maybe they'll string along for a while, he said. Anyhow, now that they've agreed to take me and my notes in place of the cure we're fresh out of. I've got to be on that shuttle when it goes back to their men at Orbital Station. Jake nodded. I don't like selling friends down the river, Doc, but, but it wouldn't do you any more good to blow up with the planet, I reckon. They won't call off the war rockets when they do get you, of course. But maybe they won't use them, except as a threat to put the lobbies back in, stronger than ever. He stuck out one of his awkwardly shaped hands, clapped the aspirator over his face, and hurried out. Doc picked up his bags and went toward the little tractor where Lou was waiting to drive him and Chris back toward Southport and the shuttle rocket that would be landing for them. They hadn't mentioned Chris in their demands, but her father must expect her return. After they had him, he'd be on his own. His best course was probably to insist on talking only to Ryan at Medical Lobby and then being completely honest. The room here would be kept sealed in case the lobby wanted to investigate where he had failed, and his notes were honest, which was something that could usually be determined. Chris could testify to that, anyhow, since she'd kept a lot of them for him. At best, there would be a chance for some compromise, and perhaps some clue for them that might eventually end the plague. They had enough men to work on it, 
and billions in equipment. At worst, he should gain a little time. Cheer up, Chris, he told her as he climbed through the little airlock. Maybe Harkness will turn up the cure before our negotiations break down. He has the whole of Northport Hospital to play with. They haven't tried to chase him out of there yet. After all, we almost found something with no equipment except wild imaginations. She shook her head as the tractor began moving. Shut up. I've got enough trouble without your coming down with Lageria. Don't be a fool. Why change now, he asked her. Everything I've done has been because I am a fool. I guess my luck lasted longer than I could expect, and I'm still fool enough to think that the solution has to turn up eventually. We know it has to be in that room. Damn it, we must know it. If only we could think straight now. She reached over and touched his hand, but made no comment. They had been over that statement of desperation too many times already, but it kept nagging at him. Something in the room, something in the room, something so common that nobody noticed it. They passed a crowd chasing down a runner. Something in that room could have saved that unlucky man. It could have saved Mars, perhaps. He growled for the hundredth time, cursing his fatigue-numbed mind. Too little sleep, too much coffee and bracky. He reached for the package of weed, realizing that he would miss it on Earth if he ever got there. Like everything here on the planet, he'd begun by detesting it and wound up finding it the thing he wanted to keep forever. He lighted the bracky and sat smoking, watching Lou drive. When the first was finished, he lighted another from the butt. She put out a hand and took it away. Please, Dan, I can stand the stuff, but I'll never like it. And the tractor's stuffy enough already. I've taken enough of it. And it keeps reminding me of our test, the three of you stinking up the place, puffing and blowing that out, while I couldn't even get a breath of air. She was getting Lageria herself now, and... The answer finally hit him. He jerked around, making a grab for Lou's shoulder, motioning for the man to head back. Bracky, it has to be! Chris, that's it! Jake picked out the second group of men from his friends, and they're all cronies because they hang around so much in their so-called smoking room. The first time, it killed the bugs for all of us who smoked, and it didn't work for you because you never learned the habit. Lou had the tractor turned and the rheostat all the way to the floor. She was sitting up now, but she wasn't fully satisfied. The percentage of immune seems about right, but why do some of the smokers get the disease while some don't? Why not? It depends on whether they pick up the habit before or after the disease gets started. Tom must have got his while he was in Northport. They wouldn't let him smoke there, if he had the habit before, for that matter. She found no fault with that. He twisted it back and forth in his mind, trying to find a fault. There seemed to be none. The only trouble was that they couldn't send a message that Bracky was the cure and hope that Earth would prove it true. No polite note of apology would do after that. They had to be sure. Too many other ideas had proved wrong already. Jake saw them coming and came running toward the laboratory, but Lou stopped the tractor before it reached the building and let the older man in. Get me a dozen men who have the plague. I want the worst cases you have, and ones that Harkness tested himself, Doc ordered, and then start praying that the cure we've got works fast. Chris was at the electron mic at once, but one of her hands reached out for the weed. She began puffing valiantly, making sick faces. Now other men began coming in, their faces struggling to find hope, but not daring to believe yet. Jake followed them. We'll test at ten-minute intervals. That will be about two hours for the last from the group, Doc decided. One of the doctors Harkness had brought to the villages was busy cutting tiny sections from the lumps on the men's necks, while Chris ran them through the microscope to make sure the bugs were still alive. The regular optical mic was strong enough for that. Doc handed each man a bracky weed, with instructions to keep smoking no matter how sick it made him. There were no results at the end of ten minutes when the first test was made. The second, at the end of twenty minutes, was still infected with live bugs. At the half hour, Chris frowned. I can't be sure. Take a look, Dan. He bent over, moving the slide to examine another spot. I think so. The next one should tell. There was no doubt about the fourth test. The bugs were dead, without a single exception they could find.
One by one, the men were tested and went storming out, shouting the news. For a minute, the gathering crowd was skeptical, remembering the other failures. Then, abruptly, men were screaming, crying, and fighting for the precious bracky, like the legions of the damned grabbing for lottery tickets when the prize was a passport to paradise. Jake swore as he moved toward the door. We're low on bracky here. Have to get a supply from Edison, I guess, and cart it to the shuttle. Enough for a sample and to make them want more. It'll be tough, but we'll get it there in time. By the time the shuttle should be picking you up, Doc. You've won our war. From now on, if Earth wants to keep her population up, we'll be a free planet. Chris turned slowly from the microscope, holding a slide in her hands. My bugs, she said unbelievingly. Dan, they're dead. Jake patted her shoulder. That makes it perfect, girl. Now come on, we've got to start celebrating a victory. It was the general feeling of most of the heads of the villages when they met next day in Southport, using the courtroom that had been presided over so long by Judge Ben Wilson. It was victory, and to the victor belonged the spoils. The Bracky had gone out to Earth on a converted war rocket that could make the trip in less than two weeks, and one packet had been specially labeled for Captain Everts. But Earth had already confirmed the cure. The small amounts of the herb found in the botanical collections had been enough to satisfy all doubts. Harkness, Chris, and Doc had been fighting against the desire to rob Earth blind that filled most of the men for hours now. Now they had the backing of Jake and Ben Wilson, and now, finally, they leaned back, sensing that the argument had been won. Bargaining was all right in its place, but it had no place in affairs of life and death such as this. They had to see that Earth received all the bracky she needed. It was only right to charge a fair price for it, but they couldn't restrict it by withholding or overcharging, and they could still gain their ends without blackmail. Martian alkaloids were tricky things, and bracky smoke contained a number of them. It would take Earth at least ten years to discover and synthesize the right one, and it would still probably cost more than it would to import the weed from Mars. As long as the source of that weed was here and in the hands of the Colonials, there would be no danger of Earth's bombing the planet. Harkness got up to underscore a point that Wilson had made. The plague lived a million years, and it won't disappear now. The jumping headache or Selznick's migraine is unpleasant enough to make us reasonably sure that there will be a steady consumption of the weed. Our problem will be to keep the children from using too much of it, probably. He pulled out a weed and lighted it, puckering his face as the smoke hit his tongue. I'm told that this gets to be an enjoyable habit. If I can believe that, surely you can believe me when I say we don't have to bargain with lives. The village men were human, and most of them could remember the strain they had been under when they expected those they loved to die at any hour. It made them crave vengeance, but now, as they had a chance to re-examine it, they began to find it harder to impose the horror of any such threat on others. The final vote was almost unanimous. Doc listened as they wrangled over the wording of the message to Earth, feeling disconnected from it. He passed Chris a bracky and lighted it for her. She took it automatically, smiling as the smoke hit her lungs. It was one thing they had in common now, at least. Ben Wilson finally read the message. To the people of Earth, greetings. On behalf of the free people of Mars, I have the honor to announce that this planet hereby declares itself a sovereign and independent world. We shall continue to regard Earth as our mother and to consider the health and welfare of her people in no way second to our own in matters which affect both planets. We trust that Earth will share this feeling of mutual friendship. We trust that all strains of hostility will be ended. The advantages to each from peaceful commerce make any course other than the most cordial of relations unthinkable. We shall consider proof of such friendship and order by Earth to all rockets circling this planet that they shall deliver themselves safely into our hands in order that we may begin converting them to peaceful purposes for the trade that is to come. In turn, we pledge that all efforts will be made to ensure a prompt delivery of those products most in demand including the curative bracky plant. He turned to Doc then. You want to sign it, Dr. Feldman? Making it as acting president or something until we can get around to voting you into permanent office? 
You and Jake fight over the job, Doc told him. No, Ben, I mean it. He got up and moved out into the outer room where he could avoid the stares of amazement that were turned to him. He'd never asked for the honor, and he didn't want it. Chris came with him. Her face was shocked, and something was slowly draining out of it as he looked at her. Forget it, Chris, he said. You're going back to Earth. There is nothing for you here. She hadn't quite given up. There could be Dan. You know that. No. No, Chris, I don't think there ever can be. You can't find a man strong enough to rule who'll be weak enough to let you rule in his place. It didn't work on Earth, and it won't work here. Forget the dreams you had of what could be done with a new planet. Those are the dreams that made a mess of the old one. I'll be back, she told him. Someday I'll be back. He shook his head again. No, you wouldn't like what you find here. Freedom is heady stuff, but you have to have a taste for it. You can't acquire a fondness for it secondhand, and for a while there's going to be freedom here. Besides, once you get back to Earth, you'll forget what happened here. She sighed at last. For the first time since he had known her, she seemed to give in completely, and for that brief moment he loved what she could have been but never would be. All right, Dan, she said quietly. I can't fight you. I never could, I see now. I'll take the rocket back. What are you going to do? He hadn't bothered to think, but he knew the answer. Research. What else? There would be a lot of research done here. It had been suppressed for too long and had piled up a back pressure that would have to be relieved. And from that research, he suspected, would come the end of the stable oligarchy of Earth. It could never stand against the changes that would be pouring out of Mars. She put her hands on his shoulders and moved forward to kiss him. He bent down to meet her and found her eyes were wet. Maybe his were, too. Then she broke free. You're a fool, Dan Feldman, she whispered, and began moving down the hallway and out of the Council Hall of Mars. Doc Feldman nodded slowly as he let her go. He was a fool. He had always been a fool, and always would be. And that was why he could never take over leadership here. Fools and idealists should never govern a world. It took practical men such as Jake to do that. But the practical men needed the foolish idealists, too. And maybe for a time here on Mars, their kind of men and his kind of fools could make one more stab at the ancient puzzle of freedom. Outside, the war rockets of Earth began landing quietly on the free soil of Mars. <laughs>